Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome again to NASM Live. And today, what we want to do is wrap up uh, CES. So you have the undivided attention of my guests, uh, master, regional master instructors, uh, Wendy Batts and Marty Miller. Uh, how are you all doing today? Fantastic. Great. OK. Now, before we jumped on today, uh, I had some connectivity issues, so uh, if I start to look all weird, that is completely on purpose. Uh, just focus on on Wendy and Marty, and they're going to wrap up CES for you uh, and make the case as make the case for why you should be using this uh, for your for your clients, for yourself, and for your clients in your training programs. Uh, so let's go ahead and. Uh, Get started, uh, Marty. Why don't we? Why don't you talk us through uh, an overview of inhibition and lengthen? Gotcha. So just like you know the, the early parts of the OPT model for that stabilization endurance training, we're using the same techniques. We're inhibiting anything that we've identified as potentially overactive, and then we're going to lengthen those same tissues because we want to calm them down. We want to restore them to their normal length tension relationship. So as we go into the second part of the continuum, which Wendy will uh, discuss, that now we have muscles that are in a more of a relaxed state, and now they're going to allow the other muscles on the opposing side of the body to do what they're normally supposed to do. So the evidence shows that this continuum is the best way to go through in restoring proper human movement. So we have to inhibit with our foam rolling techniques or you know all those other new tools that are out available to us now in the fitness industry, such as the massage percussion guns, the vibrating foam rollers, the vibrating spear, spheres, et cetera, used with the techniques that you feel the most comfortable with and most applicable for each client. Then you go into your static stretching for the muscles, again, that you've identified from their assessments that are overactive, or the way I like to describe it, causing the bad motion. They're pulling you into an excessive forward lean. They're pulling your client into feet turning out, knees caving in. So that's what you're going to attack with the inhibit and lengthen. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so we know uh, one of the definitions that we've started to use with the new CES is that it's just simply a targeted uh, flexibility training and strength training program that we can use uh, that we can use as a standalone workout or we use it as a movement we use it as a movement prep now uh, where I was going with this since you're talking about the uh, flexibility techniques uh, can you go back and explain again why inhibition is important that that's something that we just can't we just can't blow off in the training mm -hmm. session Yep, no, no doubt. And it was I was doing my coffee talk this morning at uh, 6.30 uh, West Coast time, and some of the same questions type of thing came up. Is it, like you said, very targeted, and we're trying to identify the muscles that are have a propensity to be overactive. So when we look at inhibiting, what we're doing is we're just playing with the you know neuroscience in the sense that we're putting some pressure into the muscle, an appropriate level on a scale of 1 to 10, maybe our 6 or 7. It's not about how much pain you can tolerate. If anything, the research shows that, you know, that you're not going to get as good of a relaxation because most people tend to isometrically contract or tense up. So on a pain scale of about six or seven, that pressure into that muscle belly is going to stimulate the Golgi tendon organ to sense that there's pressure going on. It's going to protect itself by causing a relaxation in the muscle spindle. In essence, I always correlated when I was learning this was, well, if I was picking up a weight that was too heavy, Thank goodness that the muscle can sense that there's too much tension, just cause relaxation or apprentice. So, you know, you and I would tear every single muscle in our body because we would keep lifting heavy weights until we thought that we could accomplish the lift. So there's that self-protective mechanism with the Golgi tendon organ that senses pressure and causes a relaxation. So that's all we're really doing is still kind of uh, playing with that uh, scientific phenomenon and getting that GTO to relax or to cause the override of the muscle spindle, I should say. Okay. Awesome. And you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the GTO. So what's, uh, can you talk again? 
can you talk again about, because I think my connection was freezing up, uh, what's going on at that, uh, what's going on at that muscle spindle? Now we have two different fibers within the yep. muscle spindle and they're, they're respond, uh, they're stimulate or they respond to a couple different stimuli. Can you talk sure. about that? So the Golgi tendon organ is going to sense the amount of tension and the rate of tension change within the muscle. And again, that's a self-protective mechanism. And the muscle spindle is gonna uh, sense the rate of length change and the amount of length in a muscle belly. So I always, again, like, yeah, I'm a visual person. So I view it, if I stuck my arm out as someone's running past me and my arm is rapidly stretched, I wouldn't have the time to think about, oh, I better contract these muscles to protect them from tearing. So those, the GTO muscle spindle are sensing that in real time and they communicate with each other. So the GTO is it's rapidly increasing the pressure or too much pressure communicates the muscle spindle to relax and just calm itself down. So that way it's a, that self-protective mechanism. And we can use that to our advantage in part of that sequence to inhibit the right muscles. So then when you do your lengthening technique, you've got muscles that were already guarded or overactive to relax. So now you get better outcomes for step two, which is lengthening. Okay, and awesome. So for lengthening, uh, now we have a couple of examples in the text in which we've expanded. Uh, normally we've used, or in the past we've used static stretching uh, we use static stretching, active isolated, and or uh, neuro stretching, uh, PNF type uh, protocols. Uh, can you explain to us the the case for using each within your within your lengthening protocol for uh, CES? Sure, static stretching is phenomenal, and I think for years it got a bad rap because it will decrease the activation of a muscle. But thank goodness, because how could we ever correct somebody's movement uh, impairments or muscle imbalances if we didn't have a stretching technique that would calm muscle tissue down so we could then, as Wendy will get into, strengthen the other muscles that are allowing that bad motion. So static stretching is a great tool in your toolbox because if you're teaching a bunch of people at once or if you haven't learned some more advanced techniques, it's very easy to teach people the static stretching. And all you're gonna do is go through the right range of motion to feel the point of tension or first compensation, back off just slightly so you're in the ideal uh, positioning and you're gonna hold that for 30 seconds and you can hold it up to a minute if you have the time or the abil ability to tolerate it. And that's gonna get that muscle to relax. Same thing that we just talked about with the muscle spindle, it'll sense that change in length, cause a, a change, and now you can go through the rest of the continuum. There's advanced techniques that you can learn where you're doing PNF, where you're going to use that Golgi tendon organ to your advantage, where you're going to apply a little pressure, relax 30 seconds, apply a little pressure, and again, use the same type of philosophy that you're using with foam rolling to just get a better stretch. And then active, isolated, again, you're just contracting the antagonist to get the agonist to relax. So all of those are acceptable. You're just figuring out what you feel most comfortable with, what you've learned, how you can teach it, and do you have the ability to do maybe one-on-one -on -one where you could use an advanced technique, or if you're training 20 people, you might just stick with your static. Okay, thank you. Those were, uh, those were great explanations, and uh, we're building the case that before you do anything uh, with any intensity, or you're trying to teach the body again to move well, you need to start you need to start there so that you can have a full range of motion. But as we understand, once you do those first two steps, it creates something that we we like to call a naive flexibility. You have to teach that, you have to teach your body to do something with that range of motion. So Wendy, what is it? <laughs> Let's talk, give us an overview. Of Give us an overview of activation and uh, integration, please. Well, absolutely. So as Marty just said, you're going to inhibit, then you're going to link, and then, and then right after that, you go into the activation techniques, which refers to the stimulus or the re-education of probable overactive muscles. You know, you can do isolated strengthening techniques or positional isometrics that will target a specific muscle. So with isolated strengthening, it's gonna increase the intramuscular coordination of a specific muscle and is achieved through the combo of enhanced motor unit activation, synchronization, and firing rate. So then you also have positional isometrics, which incorporates the isometric contractions performed at the end range of motion of a joint. 
So there's no active movement. And this is used more with people who have adequate core strength and neuromuscular control because it involves higher intensity contractions. And the purpose of this is to increase the intramuscular coordination of specific muscles necessary, ne like that, you, that is necessary, excuse me, to heighten the um, activation levels before integrating them back into movement patterns. So, so once we've activated the muscles that we have found to be underactive via the assessment, then you're going to go from there into your integration techniques. And this is going to involve the use of dynamic total body exercises. And these exercises then re-educate the body back into functional movement patterns and enhances the functional capacity of the body um, by increasing the multiplanar, you know, neuromuscular control. So basically we're working on the coordinated movement patterns. And, you know, we know that the multi-joint exercises in all planes from both bilateral or unilateral stances is going to help increase the intermuscular co coordination. And that's going to re-educate the neuromuscular system to maintain, you know, we're teaching it how to maintain the proper alignment during movement. Um, you know, we're working on, um, you know, just basically getting the body to move the way that it was meant to move. And the integration portion is going to involve, as we've talked about, the low load, um, there's very controlled movements, um, obviously always in the five kinetic, ca kinetic chain checkpoints. Um, this is all going to help ensure that the joints start and then remain in the proper alignment. Um, it's going to help muscles function in their proper link tension relationships. It's also going to help with the synergistic um, recruitment to make sure that the movement is as optional or as um, optimal as, as possible. In this section, we can also think of using the total body movements um, that will combine the, the upper body and the lower body, you know, and, and, and provide patterns, which is also going to help increase um, stress to the entire core musculature. And then after we do that, then we can get into the resistance portion of the workout. So I usually think of the CES as kind of like, again, this is kind of your, your pre warm up for your actual workout to really get the body dialed. So it's ready to go into whatever workout you're going to do. Okay, great. Thank you for that explanation. Now, uh, I've promised, uh, I've promised as we've started doing these, uh, webinars that I will not throw you curveballs anymore, but, uh, <laughs> Haircut, we we know that that is never the case, Francis. <laughs> but I'm going to throw you. Uh, I'm going to throw you since I'm a Chicago White Sox fan. I'm going to throw you a split finger. Uh, what we want to do. Uh, what I've heard, just getting out and listening to uh, listening to presenters and and how people uh, categorize our uh, CE, CES process, the way we've come to it, is is one of the arguments is, is that. I can't say that if a person has a knee cave in or valgus collapse that it's the glute medius, but what I can say is that they've, uh, they need to learn how to do the squat pattern. They need to learn how to do the squat pattern. And, uh, and I've heard that as recently as last year. Uh, so can you explain again, can you just talk us through that? Can you dispel that? myth, I guess, and talk us through activation uh, integration again within that context of the, the squat and uh, knees caving in or valgus collapse. Well, okay, you want to think about it again, think about it more of a holistic approach. I mean, obviously, we put somebody in the five kinetic chain checkpoints when what they did their overhead squat assessment. And we said, this is ideally how we want you to stand now squat. And then, of course, we see deviations because their body can't stay within that proper five kinetic chain checkpoint alignment. And that's why we see the compensations. And that's how we know, you know, if your foot turns out, this is, you know, probably overactive if the knees cave in or, or whatever the case may be. So I think we need to kind of think of it all together. So if I try to continuously teach someone how to squat, but I have an increased range of motion at the right joints to allow that proper movement pattern, then I'm really not helping them move better and, and and be able to perform a squat the way it was intended to be performed. So think about if you know to your to your point if you've got someone's knees caving in, then we're going to want to think about inhibiting the adductor complex. We're going to look at the short head of the bicep femoris because we know that's going to be overactive. We're going to think about the lateral vas uh, the lateral 
lateral, the VL, I can't even say it right now, as well as the lateral gastroc, because those are the muscles that we need to inhibit and to get some more length back, you know, and then, you know, because those muscles, when they're overactive, will pull the knee in. And then we have to think about what's allowing it. So that's when we get into the activation component. So to your point, the glute med's going to be um, underactive, the VMO is going to be underactive, the medial hamstring is going to be underactive, and then the medial gastroc is going to be underactive as well. So those are the muscles that we want to try to activate because if we get newfound length on one side that because of those muscles that were overactive and now we can really activate those muscles that were shown to be underactive just based on that one compensation alone. And then, of course, this is also we would want to think about what's happening at the foot and ankle. But if we're just talking about the knee, then I'm going to get better activation when they go down. And if I looked at them from a lateral view, I would have a better chance of them having the parallel lines, which would then give better um, uh, joint distribution between the ankle, the knee and the hip. So therefore, when they go down into the squat, and we're probably going to have better alignment, which will decrease the stress on the anterior portion of the knee. And we would get better activation of the quad and glute, which are the two prime movers of that actual squat. So, so it's kind of a, a complicated way of thinking about it, but basically we just, that's why we want to look at all the assessments that would be appropriate and then really target the muscles. I mean, it may not just be one muscle. It could be, you know, the complexes that, that would, you know, again, it's the glute med and the max that are underactive. So you want to think about what can we do to target the med and the max as well, which could be something as simple as sideline leg lifts as well as glute bridges. And then we could see, did that help clean it up? And maybe it did and maybe it didn't. But, you know, it is a process. So again, you know, we should start to see some, some corrections as we go, but it may take a few times working on the foam roller, working on lengthening those muscles and then activating those muscles to start to really see a change in movement patterns that we're, we're hoping to, to see. Okay, thank you. And before we move on, because both of you just said a lot and I can put myself in the place of a newly minted fitness professional and just I can I'm sharing the sweat that they're going through, the sweat that they're going through right now, because uh, that's that's a lot of stuff and that can be overwhelming. And uh, quite simply, both of you, uh, myself, we've we've gotten the reps. So how do you help? How do you help someone like that prioritize? With everything that both of you just said, identifying uh, overactive, underactive muscles and taking a client through that program without uh, without getting yourself fired. So, so let's I'll, start with I'll, you, Wendy. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I jump mean, in there. Again, I think it's the assessments. I mean, it always boils down to the assessment and what did you see? And then if you can identify something that's not moving properly by just putting a check mark because did their feet turn out check it if you see it that it did you you mark it down you know did they have an anterior tilt did they have an excessive lean i mean i think if you're new the first thing is to really start practicing the assessments because if you can get the assessment pretty dialed and see where the compensations lie then all you need to do is go to nasm.org and print out the solutions table and then, and then start to compare it, like, cause the solutions table will tell, like tell you exactly what to do by looking at it. It'll give you, if the knees come in, if the feet turn out, these are the muscles that are overactive and these are the muscles that are underactive. And so it, we kind of help take the guesswork out until you can start to rattle off some of these muscles and things that you're seeing. And it just takes time and practice. And the more you use that solutions table and you start to see the common muscles that are usually overactive, then, then it helps you learn it because you're constantly using that as, as your guide. Um, the thing is we're not trying to make it complicated. And again, these are muscles that are typically overactive or typically underactive. It may not be exact, but again, based on movements and how the body's lined up, these are usually what causes some of these compensations. And that's why we made that list for you. And, you know, that solutions table also gives you some examples of exactly some, some strengthening exercises on the activation side as well. So, you know, so don't overthink it, just figure out what you see and then use that solutions table that you can put on your clipboard. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything that like people are looking at you like she doesn't know what she's doing. I mean, if you have this on your clipboard, you can easily refer to it and, make your program design based on that. And then again, the more you, you, you use that, the, 
the more um, you're just going to start to know this stuff. It's practice, really. Okay. And uh, Marty, how do you, uh, that's, that's absolutely it. Use the yep. solutions. Don't, don't reinvent the wheel and, and yeah. you have to practice. So how, what's your, uh, what's your take on that, Marty? The only thing, because Wendy did such a great job covering it. So that is my answer, but I'll give another way to thinking of it is, you know, did you get into fitness to exercise people or did you get in fitness to train people? And the way, reason I say it that way, this is kind of my own internal definition. And actually we are doing a webinar, not a shameless plug. It just jumped in my head, the 27th on the difference between exercise and training, because I see a lot of people that take a certification, they get they pass the test and then they go right back to just volumizing people. And it's like, well, exercises in my definition is just a bunch of activity that burns calories. Yes, that's great. And unfortunately there are a lot of people that have great genetics and a bad exercise program can still give them some fitness results that they're thrilled with. It could be their body mass. It could be how lean they get, but Wendy and I, and you Prentice, we're going to look at they're moving now even worse than they did before. And this model was based on elite athletes. Athletes train, they undulate their program, they go through it. So really everything Wendy said was spot on. The only thing I'll add is make a commitment to be a fitness professional that's training people, not just exercising. So if you're focused on training, you're gonna create your programs ahead of time. You're gonna continually assess. You're going to look at all those little details. And the more you do that, right back to Wendy's point, is now you start to own the material because you're following a philosophy. So that's the only other, you know, different way to look at same thing Wendy said, it's just make a commitment to put people into specific training programs that are, they're capable of and that you know how to take them to the next level based on their assessment, their wants, their needs, and what phase of training they're in and should be moving towards. And yet yeah, that's, that's absolutely it. Now add one more thing do everything well number one do everything that both of you just said you know good answer understand the assessments understand the assessments practice uh train people train people and there's a there's a skill that goes with that but also i understand that people we're we're in the entertainment business as well and you can always leave time in your training session if your clients have earned it to let them do something they like if they want to hit uh hit boxing focus mitts or you know labor day uh, memorial day is coming up if they need to uh once we're once everybody's out free in their communities uh if you want big guns you can do that too just provided that you've uh that you've earned that in your training so uh one more question for the both of you and i've had this uh this come up before and this focus this centers on how do you how do you use how do you specifically use CES? And let me give you a little context. The question was: Is we've been talking about this whole process uh, for these last few weeks, but you guys never talked about CES after after rehab, after going through a rehab protocol. And like, I don't, you know, and that was, that was a very honest question. So I don't want to make light of that. That question was very sincere, but in my mind, I'm like, I kind of thought we did because that's, we're not, we're not dealing with, with rehabilitation. That's, that's not our scope. But so can you talk both of you, let's start with you since you just finished up, Marty, just, just talk about the uses of CES. Sure. So I'll talk about it in my personal life, how I use it is. As much as I know this material, I'm not perfectly efficient in my movement at all times. So I, I'm a very routine guy. You know, I, I do a lot of traveling when I'm normally back on the road uh, full time with Techno Gym. But I wake up now at the same time. I do 25 to 30 minutes of a CES continuum that's specific to me. So I'll foam roll. I'll do my ankle series, my hip mobility series, my thoracic spine. Then I go through, you know, my static stretching and then I do a couple activation techniques. And to me, that doesn't even count as exercise. That's just how I start out my day best I can. Then from there, oh, I'm still good. Yep. Can you hear me? Perfect. You got me. Okay. So from there, if I'm not going to exercise immediately, I'll repeat a few of those steps right before my workout session. And then when I'm watching TV later tonight, 
and you know, my wife is very patient with me. I have stuff littered around the house. I have different foam rollers. And when I'm watching the news tonight, I'll be foam rolling again. I got a yoga mat in the living room. I'll roll out and I'll do some more static stretching because, and I, you know, I just bought a stand desk. I try to sprinkle in what I call accidental exercise all day. And I still don't move hundred percent efficiently. Now with my clients, I do what everything that Wendy said, I assess them, I give them their homework. And the one thing I can tell you, if they showed up late and were ready to jump right in the workout, I would not allow them to. I'd make them at least go foam roll one or two things from a principal standpoint, because if I didn't force that into their program, I'm almost saying it's not important anymore. And then I would encourage them to be active seven days a week. Doesn't mean you have to exercise seven days a week, but just be aware of your posture all day long and give them some simple solutions that fit their schedule and that is manageable and to whatever commitment level they'll take, they'll give me. And it's all of a sudden you'd be amazed how they're like, you know what? That seven minutes every morning wasn't bad. I'll take it to 10 or, you know what I can add because they start to feel better. And if people feel better, right, you know, they'll do more of whatever you're asking them to do. So yes, sometimes it can be a standalone full session if someone's deconditioned or coming out of a situation, or I'll just try to throw it in kindly throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you. And Wendy, how are you using it? Thinking well, I mean, about I, our question. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, I, I don't usually deal with people right now that are out of rehab. I mean, right now I'm, I'm very fortunate because I am working more with athletes that are at a higher level. And truly the CES model is the foundation for everything that I do. I mean, I start everyone with it. So you know, I can perform hands-on inhibition and lengthening, um, well, they, because of my, of my license. So, you know, um, you know, but I, I do that and then, and then I activate the muscles that are, that are underactive or that I've noticed may be typically more underactive based on their sport or based on how they come in that day. And so, you know, this helps like reassure that they're prepped for whatever resistance portion of the workout that they're going to be doing that day, you know, because as Marty just said, if, if I know that my, my clients are prepped and ready to go, they're going to move better. They're going to perform better. They're going to feel better. And then the better the workout is, is going to really lead to better results, of course. And that makes me personally look better as a trainer because then they're hitting their goals and then they're talking about it with their friends and family or whatever. And that actually increases my business. So, so I think, you know, it's kind of all inclusive that I feel that the CES, I mean, for a long time, I was known as the corrective, the corrective trainer, you know, like, oh, you've got a problem, you need to go see this, this trainer, because she can work specifically with that. And it wasn't that I was doing anything different, except for I was following, following the protocol and the model. And, and again, it is a systematic approach. I mean, it is based on research, we, we notice these muscles are overactive, let's loosen them up. We know that these are underactive. Let's just get them doing their job. And then let's do the workout that's going to benefit that client to their goal. So I think when we when we think about it, like don't look at it as two separate things. Look at it as just a different way to prep the body, no matter what um, what area in the model or what phase of the model of training they're in. Because if you get things to activate and wake up and you get things to, to loosen up and you can integrate that back, they're going to end up being able to lift more too. So, so again, no matter what phase they're, they're in, it's beneficial for all. Perfect. So we talk a lot about, we've just talked a lot about how uh, CES, the, the four step process can be used standalone and through each, each level of the OPT model, depending on the person's goals. But uh, Marty, why was it separated? initially well initially that was uh dr mike clark's you know what he was working on with his clients or his athletes at university of north carolina and when he put it out it was to him there was no separation because as wendy said it's just this all-inclusive model as the fitness industry changed in the early 2000s and accreditation came out that was part of it and mike also developed even more content for the ces and our final phase the pes so when the accreditation came out, you know, the goal was what information does a beginning fitness professional use over 80% of their time? So that's where the middle five phases, if you want to call it, which is now the OPT models, most people know it, made the most sense. There's a starting point with stabilization endurance, and there's a nice progression through power, but it's not maybe the elite power you would take 
a high level uh, recreational athlete, amateur athlete, professional athlete through. So, cause you should have those additional skill sets if you're working with that type of client. And then same thing in reverse, if you're really focusing in on someone that potentially if you have an athletic training background like myself or massage, like Wendy and chiropractor like you, if you're adding corrective, you should also have that uh, foundation. Or if you're bringing it into fitness, you should know how to bring somebody after maybe we send them out of rehab prior to a traditional fitness. It was kind of that bridge. Or as Wendy said perfectly, here's a foundation that everyone should do some of as they move through the entire model. So that's why the CES was separated in the PES and their advanced credentials. And then our certification is the certified personal trainer, which is stabilization endurance through our first level of power training. Okay, and uh, we answered we answered a lot of the questions already from our group, but uh, Wendy, I know that you just talked about it, but let's talk about it again. Uh, how are we using CES for someone who's doing power training or someone who's also who's also earned the right to be doing some of the stuff up in PES? Sure. So again, you know, it's very individualized. And I um, mean, I use it as an extended warm up. So I have all my clients begin with some sort of rolling or again, you know, I may do some of the hands on stuff due to my license. And then I go into the activation and activation. When you think about, you know, just the OPT model is basically the core um, and the balance exercises that we're doing. You know, we would technically term that as activating because that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then once those are complete, I can perform the integration or the total body exercise portion in the resistance portion of the workout, um, you know, you can do the CES again before any workout. It just has to make sense of, you know, of, of the program that you have designed and make sure that it fits within the overall, um, you know, the overall program that you have for the day as well as overall goal for the client. So, so again, depending on, on who comes in, I mean, I definitely go through and, and activate certain muscles and then, you know, I, I do some kind of total body and then I usually do the workout. But you you can you can play around with with the components as well. It's just you want to make sure that the body's prepped for whatever is ahead, especially if you're going to do a phase five power, because you want everything to work the way that it's meant to work before you have them going 100 percent out, you know, and doing one to five reps and then superset it with with some kind of, you know, tosses, throws, slams or whatever the, the case may be. Yeah, awesome. And that was something that we covered in our webinar with the LACO as well. Mm -hmm. Just using just using a targeted warm up. Every athlete has has to get prepped for those movements, and then that integration activation is exactly like you said, doing some basic core balance exercises. Uh, and integration actually turned into uh, some of the the derivatives of Olympic weightlifting. So it fits there, and, and I'm going to uh, to to give you a, a really elaborate overthought metaphor and that's like if we think about OPT as a pyramid, CES is kind of that mortar that keeps the bricks together, keeps everything together so the pyramid doesn't fall apart. And you can think about that right down at stabilization phase, creating a phase all the way up to the apex of, of power and performance. So um, Marty, you already answered, can the CES be a workout by itself? But go back to something that you said way in the beginning. Why do we follow all four steps of this process? And do you have to? In a perfect world, you'd follow it because that's what the research shows, that your best results are when you inhibit first, because then we know how that has a better effect when you're trying to lengthen overactive tissue. And then when you can take those two parts, we know that you get a better activation. And then we know when the right muscles are activated, when you can now bring those together to teach human movement, movement patterns, you're going to re-educate, as Wendy said, the proper human movement patterns where all these muscles are starting to talk to each other, that intermuscular coordination instead of intramuscular coordination. Now, there are going to be a few occasions where maybe you cannot follow them. But what I would say is always start with step one, step two, step three, step four. Don't go step four, step one, step three, step two. If you you can't bring in foam rolling because, you know, someone has some type of 
issue where they only need a licensed massage therapist or you don't have the ability to teach it to them at that point because maybe they can't get on the ground. You only have one type of foam roller and it's too dense. Yes, if you have to go to the lengthening, that's still going to give you better results than not lengthening before you activate. But the best is when you go in that order. Now, what I would encourage you to do, though, there's so many new tools on the market where Wendy and I started this and Apprentice for You is you had one or two type of foam rollers and that was it. Now, there's a lot of different tools you can do is with the spear, the, you know, the different size spheres, different densities, the handheld massage guns, the sticks. So you should be able to give everybody you work with the ability to find a way to do some soft tissue work on their own. And then we really encourage you to have someone like Wendy or a, a manual therapist, massage therapist, that if they truly really need that level of care, at least you can refer it and say, hey, I know you can't do this every single workout, but I would love for you on occasion to get some manual therapy due to the reasons why you can't foam roll. You know, And then same thing, just always learn new skills different versions of the static stretching. Not everyone can down on the ground. So you got to have that wide diversity of tools in your toolbox, but the toolbox doesn't change of le inhibit, lengthen, activate, integrate, try to follow it best you can. Cause that's again, what the research shows is our best scenario. Thanks. And I want to follow up uh, because you mentioned foam rollers. Uh, what do you recommend? What, what density do you recommend? Uh, do you recommend even standard foam rollers or uh, vibration vibration rollers like you just mentioned? And uh, are the outcomes, are the mechanisms by which they work the same? Yeah, I recommend pretty much every foam roller you can get your hands on. And it, the reason I say that is because you have different sized people, you have different you know muscular densities, you have different pain tolerances. So you're going to need an arsenal. Back in the day when we first started this, we had a foam roller. It was that white one. And, you know, once you got past, you know, the first couple of times where it would cause some discomfort, it got mushy. You'd need brand new foam rollers almost every time because there's just the technology wasn't there yet. So I honestly, I bet you I have at least eight different foam rolling apparatuses, including a softball, lacrosse ball. And I'm the guy that on the airplane, I have the trigger point ball that I'm sitting with. I'm foam rolling then because, you know, depending on what muscle I'm trying to hit and, you know, maybe if I travel and I'm sore that day, I have to go down in a different density. So just like any other exercise, we have progressions and regressions. You need the same thing with your foam rolling apparatuses. And even when you look at the vibrating guns, a lot of them now give you different heads to choose from as well because of the density. They have different speeds and different hertz they go at as well as, you know, how much pressure you're trying to elicit into a certain muscle. So definitely it's, it's, I highly recommend having an arsenal of things for yourself or your clients. And then vibration is phenomenal. You know, the research is still coming out on the reasons why we can't say exactly the why we know that there's that neuromodulation of pain. So you'll probably be able to tolerate more pressure due to that vibrating vibration causing the term we would use is neuromodulation of pain. So it's phenomenal for that. We're going to continue when I say we, meaning the industry, will continue to do research on the why. But right now, we know it works and it works better than just standard foam rolling. They're starting to narrow in on the focus. But at least we can say due to that neuromodulation of pain, that's at least one proof reason the vibration works there are some other theories still to be proven but i would yeah. definitely add the vibration to your arsenal for sure uh can you touch on that and uh can you touch on one of the the mechanical hypotheses and that is just uh when when the fascia and you can take this i'm going to set you up and you can take this but when the fascia doesn't move it does increase in its viscosity mm -hmm. so how does the how does the vibrating roller help with that sure so one of the things and wendy can definitely touch on this as well is we know hydration is mm -hmm. great for tissue health so let's assume someone has done a lot of workouts maybe they're dehydrated as well we know that the fascia and the tissue is not going to be as pliable so the vibration one you're going to tolerate more pressure so that means you're going to be able to activate your gto to a higher level which means you hopefully and should be able to elicit a better response but also that vibration is going to move the fluid and bring more fluid to that specific area 
than if you were just using a foam roller that didn't vibrate. So you've got, you know, the definitely the theory behind it is that increase in the local fluid viscosity as well as the decrease in pain will elicit better responses. Wendy, do you have anything to uh, add to that? Oh, that was actually pretty good. Um, yes. I mean, the, the only Just thing I would... <laughs> oh, that was excellent, Marty. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, too, the vibration sometimes will decrease the pain threshold. So some some people actually prefer the vibration because they're able to sit on it longer. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to roll back and forth and find it, they can they can literally sit, marinate on it for the, the amount of time to really get the benefits of what we're looking for. So, I mean, I, my, my clients love it. I mean, again, when you're using like the Viper or something, you know, you want to think about the floor that you're on because we have wood floors in my house and the whole house seems to vibrate or it bounces around, you know, so, um, but you know, people that can't get on the floor, they can actually put the, the foam roller on their quads and, and do it themselves that way too. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of great benefits if, if you don't want to have like to Marty's point, if you can't afford it or you don't have access to a bunch of different tools, Sometimes just having one of the vibration can benefit because you get the, the roller with or without it turned on, as well as if you want to kind of give yourself a massage, you just turn it on and hold it in different spots. There's a lot of benefits for, for both. Thank you for that explanation. And for those of you listening, I want to give you a little experiment that you can do. It's, it's totally safe. I went to a science college, so I'm not going to give you anything that's going to blow up your house. But if you want to check out you want to bring to life what they're talking about, about decreasing the, the viscosity in your tissues by hydrating it with the, vibrate, with the vibrating roller. Take toothpaste, put it in a Dixie cup, put a little water in it, take your sonic toothbrush and turn it on. And you'll see how, that, uh, how the toothpaste then blends with the water and changes its viscosity. That's not exactly, but something close to what's happening in your in your fashion. Did I mess that one up, guys? No, I like it. Fantastic. I'm going to go, go try it here myself. Maybe I'll put it on Instagram. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. that's, that's cool. So uh, back to you, Wendy. Uh, Marty talked about why you should do all four steps in the, in the CES continuum. Now, do you have to perform every single assessment because we have a few uh, you have to perform every one and uh let's talk about the uh, two different two different cases uh, you have someone who you've uh, trained a while and you're just reassessing them reassessing them to see how your your training outcomes are and then compare that to someone who is just i'm um, going to use that scientific term jacked up coming straight off the couch right in right into your studio or or doing a zoom meeting with you now how do you how, tell me your assessment process for each of those two cases okay well so when we think about the assessments remember there's multiple factors that can influence you know which assessments that you should perform so think of the client's goals first and foremost their current level of activity the capabilities and their limitations, obviously super important, as well as, you know, what you begin to uncover once you start the assessment process. So if you're still not sure, um, NASM, again, we're really good with, with providing information, but they provided a recommended assessment flow chart that, you know, that kind of guides you from one step to the next. And then it recommends additional assessments that you can, you know, that you can do with your clients depending on your findings. You know, and as you learn more um, about your client and their capability to move, then when you reassess, you may do different assessments. So with that being said, you know, the first time somebody comes in, I usually start with obviously the, the transitional type assessment. So the overhead squat, if they looked like they were completely a mess, and, and, and I mean that with love, but I mean, if there was a ton of compensations there, feet were out, knees were in, huge anterior tail, excessive lean, arms are forward, you know, and I saw a ton of knee valgus, it's not safe for me to do the overhead squat at that point. So then I wouldn't right do here. it. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but, but again, we want to think of safety first. So I, I gathered a ton of information from that one assessment alone. Now, we also have the mobility assessments that are new. Remember, we, we, we still 
I mean, again, embrace using the gonies and the MMT, the the manual muscle testing and stuff. But because that was so difficult for people without extensive education, the mobility assessments in the new CES are fantastic because literally it's still subjective, meaning that you've got someone doing, you know, they're in different types of positions that you put them in. And do they go to this, this kind of degree or are they limited here? And you're just kind of looking at how they move. It's safe. You're not putting, you know, it's usually you're not putting anyone in a compromised position that's going to harm them. But again, you're getting more information that's a little more specific because it may help pinpoint certain muscles that maybe you are unsure about based on your overhead squat. So if they were, quote, jacked up, that's what you could do on a safety standpoint. Now, again, if you have a professional athlete that comes in and they did show some compensation on the overhead squat, but you still felt that they were capable and it was still safe, I would do a single leg squat assessment with them. And then I may perform the mobility assessments because, again, I, I still use a GONI personally. But, again, I use it every single day, so I'm very comfortable with, with, those, with that type of information. But if you're not, then the most mobility assessments could still fall um, into something you could do with that individual. And then I would maybe do some of the dynamic ones because it would, it would really help help me on their program design because again they're very high end athletes that are already doing stuff at high speeds very powerful movements and stuff so I want to see how do they move under you know um, uh, different environments so the Davies test the depth jump like those are some some other assessments you could do so again you know I wouldn't have someone that had a, a really um, a ton of compensations in an overhead squat do a depth jump it would not it wouldn't make sense or if someone's arms fell forward and they had a forward head, elevated shoulders, and I notice all this, a Davies may not be appropriate for, for those individuals as well. So, so again, you just want to be very cautious in, in what you're doing, but you, you just need to get the information that's going to help you design the best program possible. Because in four to six weeks, when you reassess them, you should see a ton of cleanup in every assessment that you do. And, you know, you should see them move better. They should have less compensations. I'm not saying they're all going to be gone, but you should see a ton of them being cleaned up. If not, it's a programming issue and a compliance issue as well. But usually it's a programming issue from the trainer that there's some stuff that you need to reconsider when you're designing their program to best, you know, help them with, with those assessment results. Okay. Very good. So basically what you're saying is it depends on who you have in front of you exactly is that what we uh that's what we got to <laughs> but yeah yeah you'll the, you'll definitely make the decision based on what that person is showing you if you understand what you're looking for in the assessment you'll know when to stop or when to add more tests based on their abilities and what they need to do so finally we're we're close to the end and uh this question is for both of you and before i give before I give that to you, I want to ask everyone out there, if you have questions, this is our wrap up of uh, CES. I would like you to please send your questions to these two fine people while we have time so that they can give you, uh, give you some answers. Uh, and, and finally, what I want to ask is how has the CES helped your career? Let's start with you. Uh, Marty? Not much, you know, different than the, an answer that I gave on another webinar when we talked about the CPT is, you know, this, the ability to find this earlier in my career and have a system that I could reference, learn and get better at has really just made my career, you know, it, it, it's given me every opportunity I've had because, you know, I could go in and market myself differently. I had some great people around me that helped me grow as well as my clients got amazing results. And from that, a lot of people ask me, well, how did you get these results? So it gave me opportunities to write articles or gave me opportunities to teach. And, but really at the end of the day, what was most impactful is my clients just noticed the difference. Going back to what Wendy and I talked about, she gave that awesome answer on, you know, why you'd use it. And then I just threw in there, you know, are you gonna make a commitment to train people or exercise people? And, you know, let's be clear, all of this stuff, we're just talking science. You know, Wendy and I are going to do some stuff on program design. The fun part can be in any program, so you might as well stick to the science. You know, the fun part is, do you have a personality? Can you make it engaging? But we don't have to throw the science out with it. So I'm blessed that I found this, 
man, almost 18 years ago, you know, and I've really been able to just continually use it all the time. And then for me, it's made me move a ton better because coming into fitness, I was into the powerlifting stuff. So thank God that I was able to change the way I moved earlier. Still not perfect, but working towards because, you know, I was more focused on how much weight I lifted, not how well did I lift the weight. So personally, it's helped me out tremendously with my career and my own personal experiences as well. That's great. And Wendy, what about you? How is CES, tell us again, tell us again, how has CES helped your career? Well, I mean, I think I kind of answered this earlier. I mean, because again, it is, and I, I've said this so many times, but it is the foundation for everything that I do. Um, because, and it actually differentiates me from some of the other trainers that I'm around when they're doing their workouts. Um, because again, I'm very specific, I'm very pinpoint, I'm very hands-on, but um, because I am more specific, I'm, my clients are moving better and they feel better, so they're gonna perform better. And so if I can maximize their, their movement patterns and you know, we can get to their results faster, um, because we're actually following a system. I mean, again, I'm not I'm not doing anything different than what other people are doing, except for I do follow the acute variables. I do follow, you know, the the you know um, inhibition, lengthen, activate, integrate with everyone. And so so it's just you know it kind of it separates me from the pack because I, I am very specific that way. I don't I don't even know how how to describe it, but I think. Because of that, people keep coming to me. It's word of mouth. I don't advertise myself on social media. I don't do any of that. You know, people call me like, how did you get this guy running a faster 40? And, and again, I didn't do anything other than just correct his movement. And so, so I think, you know, the outcomes that the, the clients end up getting kind of speak volumes to my training. And, and I owe a lot of it to the CES and, and the entire OPT model as as a whole, because again, the progression and the process of and being able to plug and play just makes me look better. And I and I wasn't even the one that came up with the idea. I'm just following the system, you know. So, so I mean, yeah, I I, I love it. I use it, and it's tr it's helped me out. Um, and it's helped me kind of s separate myself from others. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, so we don't have any questions today. So Wendy, I want you to keep going on okay. your line of uh, on on that line of thought that you had there, and tell us what your big takeaways are uh, for this entire process. We've spent a few weeks talking about CES. What are your big takeaways? And tell us how we can find you on social media since we just found out you don't uh, you're not using it. I, I use it. I just don't market myself on it. Um, I use it more for fun and play. Um, so, so I think my big takeaways are, you know, just don't overcomplicate it. When a client comes in, get all the information you can possibly get from them on a subjective standpoint, you know, build your rapport, interact with them, look at the overall assessments that you think would be beneficial to that client and perform them. And again, you may later think I should have done this one, but that's okay. When you reassess, add that new one in, or maybe if they come in, you can have them do a single leg squat assessment, but you're just having them do a single leg squat exercise, and then you're getting the other information that you want. Um, if you are new to this, again, Run out the solutions table. Use it. It will help you. You don't have to know every single muscle from the start in order to be able to successfully use the CES continuum. And then I think that the biggest thing for, you know, for me to, to that I, I can't express enough, the CES shouldn't be separated from anything else in the OPT. It is literally just a beginning part of a, of a workout and then do the resistance portion. So I think we need to like look at it that it should be integrated into your program design no matter what phase because you really will see positive outcomes if you do this. And um and it does, you know, and it doesn't mean that if I did static stretching I can't do some other type of stretching to prepare them for like a higher level phase, you know, meaning I could I can still do um the activation uh or the uh, static stretching and then go into active, you know, the active isolated or just active stretching that we're calling it now and then going into dynamic. So, so it's not rigid either. This is not a rigid model. It's just to Marty's point. 
think about the science, lengthen what's overactive, activate what's weak, and then do your workout. And you will find, um, you'll have a ton of success if you utilize it and just follow the system. Um, to find me, <laughs> it's uh, wendy.bats at nasm.org is my email. And then my Instagram is wendy.bats13 and Twitter is just wendybats13. Okay. Thank you very much, Wendy. It has been a pleasure over these uh, over these past few weeks chatting about CES. So thank you for all of your input, your contributions, and all of the phone calls we've had. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Getting for everything me. set up. So now, uh, Dr. Miller, what are your takeaways, and how can people find you after this is all done? Sure. So I would reiterate everything Wendy just said. So. That plus, I'll just say, make a commitment, you know, make a commitment that you're going to use the model, that you're going to learn to master the model, because that's what the science shows. And people are hiring you to get them better. Yes, they want to burn a ton of calories, potentially do some other things that they think is fitness, but put them on very specific training programs. And again, you can still have as much fun as you need using the model as you would not using the model. So you might as well use it because all your answers are there for you. And then from there, you know, just be committed to you try to get better at it each and every day and you'll see amazing results that I promise you. And then to get a hold of me, my Instagram is miller.marty72 and then email is marty.miller at nasm.org. All right. Thank and thank you as well for all of your contributions. The past few weeks, it has been incredibly enjoyable. And I want to thank both of you collectively for being here today and sharing your insight and hopefully everyone listening uh, can finally start to see how CES can work for them and their training programs. And additionally, I want to thank all of you who've been with us over the past uh, few weeks listening and hopefully learning something. And we will see you next time.